go ahead and turn to John chapter 13. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 13. Just as a very quick review, uh, John chapter 13 is where Jesus has come together uh, for the Passover, um, the feast of the Passover with his um, with his disciples here or with his uh, apostles. And we noted a couple of things in John chapter 13, and that is, um, first of all, what would have been happening, why it would have been happening, what time it was, and stuff like that. And the reason that we did that was so that we know that we have scriptural authority for the things that we do uh, for the Lord's Supper, because this is when that's established. Now, we went to the other Gospels to kind of look at that to, to see um, more in depth about what was uh, present there and we see that the unleavened bread was what they would have been eating so whenever they he breaks that bread we know it's unleavened bread because it was the the week of unleavening when they had to purge all leavening out so we know that would have been unleavening bread we also see uh, numerous times in the scriptures where uh, leavening, leavening is used as a metaphor for what for sin and um, not that it's a sin to eat leavening, but what it is, it's just saying a little leavening, leaven at the whole lump. Um, we also see that um, there are times when Jesus did some teaching uh, with his disciples, and uh, he taught them, you know, about leavening, and they realized that he was talking about the leavening of the Pharisees. You know, it, it says that. We also see something very unique in the scriptures, specifically with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the account of the of the um, Lord's Supper here, and that is what type of drink it was. And we went into detail about what the Greek actually says. Um, each one of those, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, all know the Greek word for wine. And they chose not to use that word. Instead, they used the word what? Fruit of the vine. It's very specific, and it's very specific just to the Lord's Supper also. You don't find it kind of anywhere else um, you know, but that is just very specific to that. And so they wanted to make sure that everybody understood what was, um, what was taking place and those emblems, what they stood for. Um, but in John, what we see is some of the teachings that kind of went on along with this. And um, also we see the betrayal of, um, of Judas start to begin here. Um, in uh, verse 21 of John chapter 13, it says, When Jesus had said this, and that is, Truly I say to you, who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. In other words, if you accept what I say, you accept, you know, you accept God. And then it says, when he had said this, he became troubled in the spirit. Now, why do you think he had that little trouble in the spirit? He knows what's going to happen. Why do you think he's troubled? If you look at that verse, <coughs> He gives us wise trouble. Judas will betray him. It's a it's a personal, painful thing as you know, Saul was, but then um, the fact of what that means for Judas as well. Yeah, what it means for Judas also just um, you know Christ knows he's having to go through this. But he still has this connection with these guys. I mean, later on, we're going to read here very shortly about Peter. And, you know, what the statement that Peter makes and then the answer that's given Peter back. And so we see that there's going to be a lot of um, emotions that's fixing to go into a lot of this because these are his closest friends that he has on earth. And we see also that um, <clears throat> verse 22 says the disciples start to look at one another. You know, who's it going to be? You know, what, what's going on here? Now, in some of the other uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you can look back and kind of weave all this together. There's also a discussion about uh, amongst the disciples about what? Anybody know? Yeah, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? That's, that's the, the discussion. And so... Um, with all this kind of going on, we're going to see some of that being dealt with as well. Um, but we see that he is reclining. Um, the disciples began to look one another at a loss to, to know which one, you know, is he talking about you? Is he talking about me? Who's he talking about? Who's going to betray him? What's going on? And then verse 23, when he's reclining on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, and that is the writer of, of John. And um, so Simon Peter gestured him and said, I didn't say who it is. 
And so, uh, verse 26, Jesus then answered, This is the one whom I said, I'll dip the morsel and give it to him. So he went and dipped the morsel he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now, there's a misunderstanding that the disciples have even after Jesus said this. Here's the misunderstanding. In verse 28, now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing that Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, Go buy the things we have need for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. So what was it that they thought that Jesus meant by what he said to Judas? Yeah, go get the stuff necessary for what we need to do. And, um, but we see that that uh, certainly is not what, um, what he meant by it. Just for one second here. Instead, what we see is that Jesus was telling him what you're about to do, and that is betray me, go do it quickly. And then in verse 31, it's important to note this because we see who's about to be missing with some of this teaching that Jesus is going to do. In verse 31 it says, Therefore, when he had gone out, and talking about Judas, when he had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. And so, what we see here is this idea of him glorifying the Father by what's about to happen. Now, some of the other language here, as we kind of go through, and I'm going to go and tell you, there's a lot of deep thoughts into this, and I can only tell you what I understand about it. Because the more you study it, the more you start to realize how the Old Testament and New Testament are starting to come together now through this, and some of the things that the New Testament writers will write about much later also. In verse uh, 33, he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say also to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Next verse. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, what is the defining characteristic of the children of God? Go ahead. Yeah, they love one another and they show that love because it can't be that I just say, I love you, but it has to be something that, what? Action. It has to be action that people can actually see. And so, you know, kind of keep that in mind because we later read about this in another one of John's um, writings. Anybody know where that is? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. So when we start talking about what Jesus says uh, almost immediately after here in John chapter 14 about I'm the way, the truth, and the life, you can understand what he's being, what's being stated here. And that is that without love, there is no life. You're still caught in death as John uh, writes in First uh, First John chapter three, um, and he quotes exactly this: uh, the new commandment. Uh, John quotes this uh, a couple of times in Second uh, John and also in First John. It's, it's repeated throughout also. So it is the one thing out of all of this stuff that John really kind of took uh, or tries to hit home with. And I, I, in my mind, I guess that's where he's saying: if you've read my other epistles, you'll know where I kind of got that from. And this was the setting that was around that. And um, so as we kind of go through, just kind of keep in mind that this setting is a very 
intimate setting between him and his uh, disciples here. All right, so he says, you know, I'm giving you this command, and guess what Peter took out of it? And that is verse 36. Lord, where are you going? And he says, Jesus says, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, you will lay down your life for me? And, that, and he asked that as a question. It was almost as if, really? You would lay down your life for me? And then he makes this statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So we are much like Peter a lot of times in the fact that we say, I'm willing to lay down my life for the cause of Christ, but yet, what do we do and how do we act? Many times, and we're all guilty of it, we show cowardice. We show that, you know, it's really not that important to us. And we may think it is, but it's the action that matters. And that's exactly what we're, what we're seeing here, is that you're going to deny me three times. So the very thing that you think you're about to do, and that is lay down your life, ain't going to happen. Any questions or comments so far? Go ahead, Clint. Just uh, back up there in verse 34, uh, he, he says, A new commandment I've given you that you love one another. And then he defines how that love is supposed to occur. And it's you know, self-explanatory, just as I have loved you. That's how we're to love each other, is how Christ love his apostles. And so that, that should uh, imprint on us what that takes. You know, when, when that earlier Jesus washed their feet, you know, he, he showed them how to love by serving them constantly and teaching them constantly as he was with them. Right, and you know, and, and that's why I want to kind of bring up the discussion that they were having about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Well, he's just shown, you know, with the washing of the feet, that you have to humble yourself and you have to serve. And then we see here that this is how men are going to know you, is that you have love for one another, not who's the greatest. Go ahead. The old law was love one another as yourself. The new law was put each other above yourself. Very good. Um, this, this new commandment is actually mentioned, like I said, a couple of times. If you wanted to turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light hates his, and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. So we get this idea whenever he's talking about our relationship with one another, we're, when we uh, have this idea of there's light and there's darkness. And if you have darkness, you're stumbling around, and yet because you have hate. If you have love for one another, and that is a true active love, and whenever we get to John chapter 14, um, we'll see something that he says to them that um, shows that they, it's got them at least thinking. Um, but what we see also in John, whenever you go to John chapter 3, 2, and 3, we start seeing that Jesus was the light and that the world did not accept the light because their deeds are evil, but yet the darkness cannot overcome the light. And so we see this idea um, spilled over into 1 John as well. Um, other places it's mentioned is... Um, well, where did I go? Uh, other places mentioned is John chapter... Uh, 2 John chapter 5, 2 John verse 5, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that you love one another. So John continues to point back here, and he continues to say, this is kind of the beginning of all this, the, the new stuff. And, um, and at that point that he wrote it, it's not like it's anything new. You know, we ought to know that we need to show our love for one another. 
any questions or comments. And there's other references that we could go back to. Um, you know, whenever Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, what was the answer that Jesus gave? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's, a, that's from the Old Testament, back in Leviticus. So, you know, we understand that, you know, he's going on God's Word. And now, this is something new, though. And that is, you need to love each other just as I have loved you. In other words, he's now become the example. Any questions or comments? All right, let's move on. John chapter 14. Now, after he states, makes this statement, um, in verse 38, Will you lay down your life for me? Really? Truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Verse 1 says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwellings. And if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So he tells them, right after he tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times uh, before the rooster crows, and then we also see that they were talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom. We talk, we talk about love, and also he says that he's going to go away where they cannot follow him for now. So what do you, why do you think he makes that statement there in verse 1? Do not let your heart be troubled. What he said is, you believe in God. I'm his son. You should believe in me. Without believing in me, you cannot believe in God. Right. And if you believe in me, you believe in God, you'll have eternal life to obedience. Very good. Yeah, and he's teaching them that he's he's kind of the way to God. Um, why are they troubled? Quick, Clint. Back up in verse 33, he says, Yet a little while I'm with you. You can't go around it. You know, so he's, he's kind of set the stage by I'm leaving. And so I think they're kind of grasping that. Why are you leaving? Right. We're not really ready for you to be there. And you remember some of the other teachings that he had about how the light was with them, but the light will have to go away. But whenever you turn back to 1 John, what does it say about love and hate? There's light and there's darkness, and the light is now coming to, you know, darkness is now going away. So light is actually coming back is what, it, you know, the indication to us. Hank, go ahead. Oh, I, I was okay. really basically saying the same, same thing Hank was, but he was prepared for yeah. what was about to happen. Yeah, he's prepared them, and just as Charles pointed out, the teaching that kind of goes along, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's no, no need for your fear. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Um, and then he said he makes this statement to them, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Uh, I'll come again, receive you to myself, uh, that where I am, you may be also. In other words, you can't go with me now, but you will be able to go with me later. And you know the way where I am going. Now, Thomas... You know, it seems like, you know, Thomas is kind of confused a lot uh, a lot of times. And Jesus really kind of takes his, his time with Thomas and really kind of explaining what he means. And Thomas, in verse 5, says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we even know the way? So, we, you know, you're talking about going away. We don't even know what you're even talking about. You want us to find our way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All right, so what's Jesus' answer to him? And I give it to me in words that, you know, you kind of understand this. If he were to say that to you and you were Thomas, what, what would you take out of that? Go ahead. Pretty much the same thing Thomas did. Because we, we have to appreciate they really don't have any idea about what's going to unfold. Right. Even when they're standing there right before he ascends, they're asking, when's the kingdom going to be restored? He's just waiting, okay? There's, 
you, you don't get it yet, but you're going to get it. Um, so right now, their, their mind is spinning. They've had an entire week conflict with the Jewish leaders. The tension is building. Uh, here he is on this night with them, very somber in what's going on here. And they feel the weight of that. Right. And as he's explaining, I'm going away, he had said back in verse 36 of chapter 13, you shall follow me afterward. And they, they can't figure out where would you go? They're thinking physical terms, and he's really what he's doing is he's preparing them that later they'll be able to look back at this and go, "That's what he was talking about." Yeah, you know we have the benefit of looking back, and you know he had just made this statement, and he says in verse four, "And you know the way where I am going." So he's telling them, you already know. But Thomas is still a little confused. And so, notice what he says, and now let's finish the statement, because the statement doesn't just end, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would know my Father also. From now on, you know him, and you have seen him. So, what is he saying about this way and where they ought to be going? Where are they walking toward? Where are they going towards, spiritually speaking? Towards the light? Towards the Father? Correct. And I am that way. You cannot get to the Father except through me. That is it. That excludes any other ways that you try to get there. Um, whenever he says this, and this is this is um, you know was kind of interesting to me just because of the way that John kind of set things up um, in in the in the book, and we know that he's already uh, mentioned um, about Jesus being the truth or the Word. The Word was manifested; it became flesh and dwell among us. So he's the truth. And we also see that he's also the life. Jesus says, you know, what would he say about him being the, the water and you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. I'm the eternal life. And we also see now that he's saying, I am the way to the Father. And that's where you got to come. And so Philip says to him, now, notice what Jesus has just said to them. And that is, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now, notice what Philip says. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. So, is there still some misunderstanding on Philip's part? Yes, there is. What's he thinking? It's hard for them to move from the physical to the spiritual of the whole. I, I think it would help for me. Yeah, it, it would be for any of us. Now, again, we've got the we've got the whole story, and most of us know it all the way to the end. So we're able to kind of look back. However, what we see in Philip is kind of like what Moses had asked for. You were going to say that too. Go ahead. I was just about to say that Philip's went back to wait, see him. There's only one person. Here. We see him? Uh, right. I feel like this would have been my question. Uh, right. Where, where is he? Show him to me. You know, it, that'd be enough for us. You know, but um, what we see is that's where he is. And then Jesus uh, answers him and says, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does His works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. So, look at it from this angle. Either believe the words, believe the, the signs, the miracles, whatever it is that gets you there. Now, 
I, you know, I could ask which way is better, but you know, the fact is this, that John wrote these things down and he says I wrote these miracles down, so you would what? So you believe, and in believing you would have eternal life in his name. So when we read them and we see what happened, and they show that he is the Son of God, that is the evidence that's being presented to us. It's the evidence that was presented to him. And no matter how, however you get there between the two, get there. But he also puts this, this statement on it also. In verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. The greater works and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. So he just told them right there where he's going. <coughs> right now you can't come but you know the way and the what I am the way verse 13 whatever you ask in my name I will do so that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask me anything in my name I will do it now let's talk a little bit about this you know he's trying to bring glory to the father so uh, as we kind of move through this, notice what he says about this glory uh, to the Father, and can we just ask for anything? Is that really what he's saying, that I can ask for millions of dollars and then get it? He's going to do it for me. What's, that, what's, what's the scope or the context in which this sits? Primarily, what he's speaking to there is to the apostles themselves. And yes. What? Transpire for them, yeah. Yeah. So we have the audience. Go ahead, Stephen. He'll, he'll be sending them out under his authority. He's saying, basically, you submit to my authority, you live by my authority, you follow what I do. Anything you ask within that context, that realm, that's what I will do. Correct. Yeah. That's the, that's the context in which it sit, uh, sits in because. Um, you know, we, we've seen numerous times, he who believes me will do my words. He who believes in me will love me. In other words, this showing of, of, the, uh, of the belief. Go ahead. And to the point that Rick mentioned, he's, he's talking to the apostles, uh, and we have to keep that in context. That's the primary audience here. We're a secondary audience, just like in March 16, 16, when he, or rather uh, 17 and following, talks about those who believe in him will do these signs. There, in that context, just like this context, he's talking to the apostles. Right. That if you believe, because they had, they had skepticism. Even after he was raised from the dead, there was some skepticism. They, they didn't understand it, couldn't comprehend it. He had to try it again for them to really grasp what had happened. And he's emphasizing here and then later you have to believe. If, if that's missing, you're going nowhere. Yeah, and you know, and I want to point out again also the way that that word belief is used in all throughout John. It is an active thing. And we see that exactly being stated here in um, when he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So that love being shown as an action, and we also see, uh, as he mentions here, believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me, otherwise believe the works themselves. You're going to be able to do even more powerful works than that. Go ahead. Uh, just to tie it together, you jump to Acts 3, Acts 4, mm -hmm. where Peter heals the lame man in the temple, and he said in the name of Jesus Christ, when I said the law. And then later, when there's a question about that, he said in for the Jewish leaders, know that it's in the name of Jesus that this has been done. And that's what he's talking about here. You ask anything in my name, by his authority, he will do it. So Peter had asked the Lord to kill that lame man. Later on, Acts 13, Paul asked the Lord to strike even this the sorcerer blind. And he did. So that's really what he's driving at here. He talks about these works that they're going to do. They're going to go out. They're going to help establish a church. They're going to teach the gospel. They're going to harvest souls. All those things that they would be doing would be this great work of redemption and the kingdom of God. 
kingdom. Right. And, you know, whenever he starts talking about the glorification of the Father, understand that this that's where this conversation kind of actually started. In John chapter 13 and verse 31, um, it says, Therefore, if you're going out, uh, and that is Judas, Judas left, it says, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in Him. And now we're getting right back to where we started this whole conversation, and it's about the you know glorifying God. And all of these things that they're going to uh, be doing, teaching, um, and, you know, as, as you stated, you know, the establishment of the church and all of these things that are going to be happening, well, guess what? It's for the glory of God. All right, so whenever you look at this greater works than these, he will do because I go to the Father, and that is I'm leaving. Um, so you're going to do greater works. And, I, and I'm glad that you brought this up, Stephen. You know, I was um, going to say, what are some of the things that they did? Just kind of start from Acts chapter 2. 3,000 souls were what? Baptized. Later on, they're teaching, you know, and we have um, the, the lame uh, man. So more attention is being brought. People are being brought to souls for Christ for that. We have the establishment of the church. We see the church start to flourish. And all of this fruit that is starting to multiply because of the teaching that uh, God that Christ gave them and, and he's telling them this is how you get to the Father you've got to let everybody know this that's what brings glory and honor to the Father and so we see that they have done us a great service in their work that they have done um, previous to us getting here into the church you know all the establishment of the church the very foundation of it all the writings that they did, all of the um, teachings that they did. We see Paul coming on later on. However, just these just these men alone, and look at the uh, significance that they made in the world. And yet we see all of these things that Christ did made an impact where? Made an impact in Israel. In Israel. He, in Israel. He was sent to Lot. Uh, to Israel and specifically makes note of and there's one famous story about the woman that comes to him and says, you know, we just want the promise. Right. So I, I'm not sent for you. And that wasn't that he didn't love her, but he had a very narrow, specific mission and their mission is going to be worldwide. Right. And the scope had to happen there because uh, of the prophecies that happened previous that it was going to come from Jerusalem, you know, and stuff like that. And so we start to, to see that kind of come to place. But these men take that, that work and which started here and really glorified God throughout the world and included Gentiles, people of every race. And um, so we see that exactly what Jesus said would happen is happening uh, with them later on in the story. Any questions? All right, so uh, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so it is a love that if you love God, rather than the, you know, the approval of man or the approval of God, you know, if you love God, you're going to keep the commandments that he gives. And uh, he goes on to say in verse 17, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And so here's the, you know, we start talking about the Holy Spirit and the role that the Spirit will have in what context? Who's he talking to? To the apostles, specifically to the apostles. So um, as we uh, look at that, um, and it says, this is the Spirit of truth, the world does not comprehend it, does not know it, but he says it's already abiding in you. So you have truth, you have the spirit. Where does truth come from? The way that we perceive it. How do we draw truth? Where do we go to? We go to the Word. We go to the Word, and the Word was given to us by, by what means? 
Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. These men would later on start to write the New Testament uh, and others as well. Uh, we get to read their mail and you know see some of the problems that they had in their congregations and stuff like that. But we get to see the history of how things are laid out. And the reason that you are able to do that is because of what you have sitting in your laps today. It is absolute truth. It was given to us by the Spirit. These men are the ones who wrote it down. We're reading one right now that he was actually speaking to. And so we see how all of that kind of starts to come in. Now, later on in John chapter 17, we'll see that, you know, um, even more about this. However, I did want to just say this is kind of where that, that conversation starts about the Spirit. And then in verse 18, I'm not going to leave you alone as orphans. I will come to you after a while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I, because I live. You will live also. Now, he also says in verse 20, and in that day, what's going to happen for you in verse 20? You know why I'm in the Father, you and me, and I and you. You know that we're all together then, and that everything has been perfected the way that it should be. And, you know, uh, this to me is another sign that Jesus has given them of who he is. And um, we see even with this, you know, that some of the apostles, they, they don't see him, and they go to Thomas, and Thomas, you know, says, well, if I could touch there, you know, and all that. And so we see all of that kind of uh, unfolding later on in the story, but what we see is this is where that promise to them is made. And it says that you're going to know that I am from God because of that. Um, and then in verse uh, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. So, see how the symbiotic relationship starts to happen between the apostles and Jesus and God, the Father. But we also see something else about this love. And what does he say again about love? What's the qualifier for that? Keeping. Keeping the commandments. And, you know, and, and I want you to kind of remember what commandments that he's given to them just in this. And remember he said, I'll give you a new commandment, and that is to love one another. You're going to need one another. Because what they're about to undertake is not something they want to do alone. Then Judas, that is not Iscariot, because remember he's gone, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And so there's some more questions about this. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, what, he asked the question, and what was the answer? Through my word. Through my word. Basically the same statement that I just said. I mean, there's really not a whole lot of, you know, I don't can't explain it to you any, any easier other than you need to continue in my word. That's the main thing. And if there is a theme that we see in John chapter 14, it is love is staying in the word of God, staying with the commandments of God. That's how you show your love towards God. Now, we often, you know, talk about love. God's love for mankind is never under question because here in the next 24 hours of this story, a lot's about to happen. And we will see God's love demonstrated for us. So God is not just a, a God of word, but a God of deed also. And whenever he says, I love mankind, he means so much so that he is going to sacrifice the person here who is speaking these things to these apostles. He's willing to do that for us. What's always in question is our love. And God is telling us here, because remember, if Jesus is the way, 
Um, what he's speaking to us is the way to God, and this is how God wishes for us to show our love towards him. <coughs> Any questions? I just Yes, go ahead. He's, he's explaining to them directly how that he would be in them and they would be in him. How he would make his home with them, the Father would make his home with them. And we understand that it was not personal bodily indwelling. Right. It, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell with us all the same way. And He's laying it out very precisely. It's through my word. To keep my word, then I'm in you, you're in me. My home's with you. The Father's home's with you. So it's, it's no different for us today. Well, if we fast forward through the story of the, of the apostles and what they did with establishing the church, which is later on the temple of God, and they are kind of the foundation um, pieces in that and you know the you know the cornerstone and you know their work actually started that where does God dwell but in the temple and so we see that kind of being played out also on a much more spiritual level than um, you know even I can understand I mean I can only kind of piece together some of you know what he's trying to say here without you know any more given to me than than this but I do know that he does say, you know, that he's going to dwell with them. And he actually, if you start back up in John chapter 14 about the dwelling places that he's got, that he's going to make a dwelling place for them. And that is, to me, I think that he's talking about, you know, um, you know the, the temple and the spiritual temple. I don't know. But um, all I'm saying is he's talking a lot about dwelling places here in this as well. It's worth studying, I guess. All right. Um, why is God, why is uh, Christ doing all of this? Let's move on down. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. So I've been with you, I'm speaking these things to you, but the Helper, and that is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, throughout John, we see the hints of this. And that is, you know, he'll say, the disciples did not know that he was talking about this until later on. The disciples didn't know that whenever he said he would rebuild the temple in three days, that he was actually talking about his body, not the actual temple itself. The disciples didn't understand that until later. And so John is kind of showing that in action as he's writing this stuff down. And, you know, like we, like we, we just read one in John chapter 13, where what Jesus said to Judas Iscariot, what you do, do quickly. And what did, uh, what did all the disciples think that he meant? Hurry up and go buy bread and fruit or whatever. Go and get all of that. And so he says later on, it became apparent what was being stated. So obviously at that moment in time that this is being written, He's calling to remembrance, and that's exactly what the Helper came for. And so, keeping it in context of he is talking to his apostles about this, we see that they are uh, given the Holy Spirit. Specifically, we see it when? Acts what? Acts chapter 2, we see that happening. And um, we see that... Um, Peter kind of steps up and he's the spokesman and he gives this sermon uh, about uh, salvation and how to get to God and he mentions Jesus because Jesus is the way to life, to the Father. Now, um, we've only got just a couple more minutes. Any questions so far? Any comment? Alright, so he says, the helper of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send to you, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So don't worry too much about not getting it all. It's going to happen. And then in verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, 
do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Now that's where we started in John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. This teaching continues on, and now he's kind of come back to the full circle with them about what he's been talking about and why their heart should not be troubled. And we also see here that he says, I'm going to offer you peace, but it's not like what? It's not like worldly peace. So whenever we talk about love, peace, and joy, we are talking about something far different than what the world talks about in these things. Go ahead, Rick. Peace us all understanding. Exactly, yeah, I'm going to turn that on. we got time, but yeah. Peace that uh, surpasses all understanding. Um, you know, but all of these things that, you know, we don't want misconceptions on, well, we have to be able to define exactly what this peace, this love, this joy is. When, when the world talks about love, they're talking about emotion. Whenever we talk about love, we're talking about an action that happens. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's the action that goes along with that. And we also see that, <clears throat> excuse me, we also see the same thing for us. We can talk the same thing about faith. Tell me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. I don't even have to say a word. You can see it. And we also see, and that's in uh, James chapter 2, but um, in verse 28, or verse 27, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. You've heard me say that. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So if you understand what I'm talking about, you would be joyful that I'm actually going to go see the Father. The very thing that you want to do, Philip, you want to see the Father, rejoice that I'm going to see the Father. And then he says in verse 30, I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Now, verse 31, please take note. But so the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. Now, when he says that, Whenever he's talking about love, it is something that he does as well. Not only that, but he says, I go very willingly. Now, as we before you get to the next uh, chapter, in John chapter 15, before next week, I want you to think of all the ways that Satan tries to threaten him to try to get him to not go willingly. Because if he doesn't go willingly, and he goes out there, and he's kicking, and he's screaming, don't do this, please don't do this to me, and, and, he's, and he's doing all of that, then what does that show the world? But if he goes willingly, it shows the world, this is the Father's desire that I am sacrificed on your behalf and for your sins. So verse 31, there is a lot packed inside of that that I think sometimes we just kind of overlook and say, well, he just wanted to obey. But the world has to be able to see his obedience. They have to be able to see that he's doing this willingly. That's why when these monkey trials start to happen, what does he say to a lot of them? He doesn't even answer. He just goes along. And we see also Scripture being fulfilled by that, specifically in Isaiah chapter 53 when it says he goes as a sheep gone to slaughter. And we see that that is the fulfillment of this. And that's why we see no resistance out of Jesus. He is willingly do the, doing this because this is what the Father desires of him. And he does it even to the point of death. That is the example that we also should have. We are going to do the Father's commandments. We're going to do what He asks, even to the point of death. Any questions or comments?
All right, we'll start John 15 next week.